All right, welcome to the Utah CTO Show. Uh, we appreciate you being here again. Thank you for listening. Um, today we have with us Matthew Barlocker from Blue Matador. Matthew, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Matt is uh, CEO of Blue Matador, and uh, but you um, maybe maybe you want to tell us a little bit about this, but um, your your background is kind of more in engineering. That's right. Yeah, computer science degree. Worked in numerous startups as engineer, front end engineer, back end engineer, engineering lead, chief architect. Yeah, so a very very heavy engineering. I, I don't think it takes. Uh, you know, business person to be a CEO. It's more about the person with the vision. And in our particular company, the, the vision is technical. Therefore, technical person is uh, is the CEO. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, is there, um, you know, like what is it like to be the engineering C CEO? <laughs> yeah. Great question. Uh, busy. All, all, always busy. So when you're developing the product, you know, you, you got the engineer in mind. Everything is controllable. Right? There are some unknowns that you just, you'll never figure out. Uh, like, hey, you know, I was integrated with a certain API and, and then it changed underneath me, and new release, new version, whatever. Uh, and so I had to deal with that. However, business is that times 10. You, right. you can't control anything, right? You, you get a phone call from an investor, you, you take it, right? Uh, you get a sales call, you take it. Uh, you, you have more meetings, you have more, there's just a lot more that you've got to do that is out of your control. And so then you end up doing all of the things that you're supposed to do in the off hours when you should be spending time with family. It, it, it's just less control and always busy. And how much of that is like outside of your comfort zone? I'm curious, just because you know coming from that same sort of background, like that's not easy. Yeah, uh, I, comfort zone different than. Sorry, that's not a word. Uh, it's not a sentence. Comfort zone is different than uh, than like preference. Mm -hmm. It's all within my comfort zone. Like It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I, I used to play, uh, or I, I still do play uh, piano, and you know, so I've done a lot of recitals. I used to be in a, produ a per percussion group who did a lot there. I was in the Olympic band. Uh, I have no problems being in front of or even speaking in front of groups, but preference, it's not my preference. Mm -hmm. I prefer to be coding. I prefer to be you know, reading documentation, fixing bugs. In fact, the, the thing that I like absolute most is uh, scaling infrastructure, right? Uh, so finding the the choke points and then fixing them. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. so, so, uh, tell us a little bit more about your career. Like, how did you grow up in tech, and then and then how did you get to where you are today, where you started and founded Blue Matador? Yeah, my my, I, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, that, that was just fun. You know, yeah. so I, I followed space, I loved stars, I loved, uh, you know, rotations and, you know, uh, everything to, with the, the moon and, and Mars and, and the sun and, and different, uh, you know, tell, tell me about the Alpha Centauri and, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Loved that. In fact, I still follow that today. Uh, so wanted to be an astronaut, wanted to go into space. And one day, you know, I, I got pretty good grades. And one day my, my dad pulled me aside. He's like, hey, come, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's go on a drive. He said, hey, uh, how many astronauts are there? I told him the answer. I don't remember the answer anymore, but I mean, it's very, very few. Right, right. And, you know, how many have gone into space? Well, very few. He said, do you think you're smart enough to be an astronaut? Oh. <laughs> no, right? Brutal. <laughs> yeah, brutal. Thank tough, you, Dad. Tough conversation. <laughs> uh, so it took a turn, but then, you know, he ended up convincing me. I, I, you know, I, I'm not the top 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of people. Therefore, you know, maybe I ought to try computers. Turns out I loved it, and it worked out really well. So I went to went to college, got a computer science degree, and uh, kind of find my way uh, into the back end. I love databases and infrastructure and APIs and anything on the server side. Uh, I, I will gladly avoid JavaScript any day. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. not, not my favorite. Yeah. So. Um, uh, so that's really cool that, uh, you know, obviously you didn't get to be like the Air Force test pilot leading into the astronaut career, but um, obviously there was a lot of other things along the way that kind of led to Blue Matador, and I think um, one, of, one of your stops was Lucid. That's right. Um, that's a r pretty successful company. Um, was that a difficult uh, decision to, to leave? When did you know you were going to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, Lucid was difficult to leave. I've, every other company that I've left, I have left because I've stopped learning. Whether that be it slowed down or stopped, or you know, big uh, big roadblocks in my way, whether that's uh, big corporate red tape or you know whatever it was, and Lucid never had any of that. 
Uh, so my, my progression throughout the, the company is uh, right out of college, I was at a company for 18 months, and then the next one was nine months, and then the next one was six months, and the next one was three months. I kid you not. Uh, it's almost at the exact marker. And then Lucid was five years, uh, <laughs> and I really loved it. There's a lot to learn there. It's a great company uh, led by great people. And so it was a hard decision. Uh, I, I didn't love it. As far as becoming an entrepreneur, my dad's an entrepreneur. My grandpa's, both grandpas were entrepreneurs. I, this is not uh, not a shift for me. Yeah, it's in my blood. It's how I always think anyway. Uh, I, I tend to do things that are more risky yeah. than the average person, right? Uh, that's <laughs> testament to that. You're in a cast right now, as we speak. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the listeners that can't see. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, yeah. cat, bro both feet broken right now. Uh, left foot shattered, right foot broken, because uh, I was climbing on a ninja thing. Turns out I'm not a ninja. You know, so. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I, I naturally take, take risks. And the, the turning point was I, I had this event. You know, so, so Blue Matador is all about monitoring and... Uh, the, the turning point was I had an event where monitoring didn't solve my problem. Something was missing, and so I, I, you know, I looked into it. Nobody was solving the problem, so then I jumped. And, uh, yeah, it, it, while it was hard to leave Lucid, it, it, it's turned out really, really good. Yeah. So speaking of Blue Matador, curious, you know, what experiences maybe at Lucid or, or some of your other companies led to and informed a little bit about what you're doing at Blue Matador? Yeah. So... That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I love databases. I love backend. I love APIs. And everything that I do, it's all about scale. So we built an infrastructure that scales really, really well. That, that's helped, although you would never see that in our app, right? It, it just works. Mm -hmm. uh, other things that, that may have contributed to it, I love automation. And not exactly from, from a prior company, but uh, everything that we do at Blue Matter, it's automated. You actually cannot configure it, even if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's come from, a, uh, from, from a number of different companies, you know, just loving automation. Uh, other things, I love board games. Uh, so at Lucid, I, I kind of instilled it at Lucid, but I, you know, I definitely took it from Lucid as well. We played board games. Yeah. Uh, in our team area, we'd always have one set up, whether that's yeah. Junkyard Racers, love that one, Thunderstone Shard we were talking about earlier. Uh, shoot, I, I, I ought to name some more because I love board games and you ought to get them. Uh, was it <laughs> Lords of Waterdeep is a really great one. It's a, we, we look for these asynchronous, turn-based, uh, thoughtful games right. where you can play them at your leisure. You have a bug, go fix it. You need a break. Go play the game for two minutes. Right? Take your turn, yeah, yeah. and and so we we've got a good number of those. Uh, yeah, board games. Yeah, <laughs> taking awesome. that step away um, sometimes to a hard problem and just doing something that's unrelated can help you solve that problem too. It seems and, like. <laughs> and and the dynamic of really screwing over your teammates is amazing. It's, oh, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> you know, ruining their next turn and, and laughing about it to yourself while you're mm -hmm. fixing the next bug. It's perfect. It adds con confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, get it, if you could get into a little bit more detail about, about Blue Matador, we you know we had breakfast. We talked a little bit about what you guys do and and um, how this is beneficial to and, and in our case our listeners, but to those that are in engineering. Um, tell us a little bit more about that, what you do, and then all the things that you're monitoring. Like it's it was really interesting technology when you brought that to our attention. Yeah. So. Perhaps to give the context, right, and you're probably going to ask me about this here in a minute anyway, but I'll, I'll go into it, the founding go story. Yep. Uh, Lucid Software, I was at Lucid Software, and again, great company, I don't mean to harp on them by any means. My responsibility as chief architect was uptime, availability, reliability, stability. It was my job to make sure that everything worked smooth. So when the CEO came to my desk, I had a bad day, a VP of engineering was at my desk, I had a bad day. Basically, you could tell how my mood was by how many people were surrounding my desk. <laughs> Not that I'm, you know, I, I am a people person to some extent, but that, you know, just more the underlying indicators of failure in the application would represent themselves as people at my desk. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my wife was having her third baby, and we're at the hospital. We checked in, it's the morning, having a C-section. She has the operation, you know, everything's healthy, fine, the baby comes out happy, uh, well, you know, as well as you can tell, a screaming baby is happy. <laughs> and then she went to the recovery room because they knocked her out, and I went to the, uh, was it the, like, the ward, the, the bedroom, yeah. whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then I got a call. 
you know, I'm, I'm holding the baby just less than a few hours old. I got a call from Lucid. It was the VP of engineering. And he said, everything's broken. The demos are down. Sales team can't do anything. Support is inundated. Engineering is stumped. We, we can't figure it out. Help us. You're only yeah. help. You know, very Star Wars-esque. <laughs> And the most frustrating, so I, I did reluctantly put down my baby, put him to the side, opened up my laptop, started working on this with crappy Wi-Fi, and I fixed it. You know, it wasn't particularly heinous. It wasn't that bad of a problem. We got it fixed, rolled back the release. The, the frustrating piece was that when I was in the office, when I was at my desk, when I could have fixed the problem, that's when the problem happened. And nobody knew about it. Uh, we had a developer, you know, great developer, no, no fault of theirs. There was just a bug. And when they released this new feature, it just went out and they didn't look at it. And so nobody noticed it. And yeah. the, the product manager didn't look at it. Yeah. And, and they didn't tell me that they had released, so I didn't look at it. And, yeah, and nobody's ever done that before. <laughs> yeah, never, never. And you were the bottleneck. You were the single point of failure. And this is in the middle of, of this important family event. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we kind of relied on our, all of our monitoring tools to find this thing for us, to give us a timely, actionable alert. It just didn't. Yeah. You know, we, we have a bunch of monitoring tools I won't name uh, because I don't like to badmouth, but none of them did their job. Yeah. Uh, come to find out their job, they see their job as we'll give you graphs and dashboards. And to be honest, I don't have time to look at graphs and dashboards. Yeah. Uh, th that's what knocks do. And and we, we don't have the money to pay for a knock. We, these, these graphs and dashboards, they aren't particularly helpful in being proactive. You right. have to watch it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I looked for another solution that I could add to the monitoring mix. Nothing existed. Boom, Blue Matador. All right, so Blue Matador, the idea is we will find everything that you're not looking for, that you don't have time to look for, that you don't uh, have the time to set and fine-tune uh, thresholds and tell us what matters and tell us what doesn't matter. We will go out and we will discover what matters to you on, a, a, on an automatic uh, system. So we'll find everything like in your ELP. So we, we, we work really well with AWS and with Kubernetes. And then we have an agent that you can install as well on Linux or Windows. And we'll go out and with that information, we're just going to start pulling everything from CPU and load to ELB and, and CloudWatch metrics and Kubernetes services and daemon sets and all the things We'll just pull it in, and then we're going to just you know, crunch our numbers and send you things without you having to tell us. Uh, I forget where I was going with that. <laughs> so. uh, well, it seems like, you know, as, as um, you know, I'm a systems admin, sort of, at Nuvi. Um, you know, I watch our, our cloud infrastructure, and I have this, you know, email folder that's just full of all the notifications that I get from our monitors. And I just, like, it's just a big mess, and I don't even know what's important, what's not, so I just ignore it for the most part. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but... Well, well, you're the first. Nobody but, ever does that. Right, right. But it, it's, not, it's not proactive enough in that, you know, we, we fix something when it goes down, and we know there's something wrong when it goes down, and that's, and that's not as proactive as we would like it to be, right? And so how does that solve that problem? Yeah. Let me give a, a couple very concrete examples. Sure. Disk space. I'm going to bring this one up. I mean, it's a total newbie mistake. Who would run out of, out of disk space ever? But it happens all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we were speaking to a, a very large uh, you know, tier one company that just had it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so in disk space, the problem is you have multiple mount points across all your server banks. And you also have different rates of usage. And you're also lazy, right? Uh, or at least I am. I, I want to make the simplest problem. So when I do a monitoring tool, I go in and I say, hey, track that thing. And across all mount points, just tell me when it's 95%. Right. The problem is if I'm using 5% a minute or 5% an hour, I, I may not get that with enough time to do it. Or I may release a new mount point And you know, maybe I have to hard code which mount points I want it to uh, watch. And, and so when I release this new one, this is, I mention this because this has happened to me in right, particular. Uh, and, and the new mount point breaks, and, and now it's broken. So what Blue Matador does is you install the agent. We'll go monitor all the mount points. We don't care if it's you know ephemeral. We don't care if it's an EBS volume. We don't care uh, if it's just an on-memory thing. We don't care. We will go mount, watch all of those. And instead of this 95% static threshold, we're going to view it as more of a rate and capacity problem. 
So instead of you know give me 95%, which is totally useless, imagine a 16 terabyte disk, right? Like the 95% doesn't mean anything. Uh, we will go in, we'll say, hey, here, here's all your disks, all your mount points, and how much time do you have left on these? Yeah. And as soon as we find out how much time, then we can kind of break it up into whether it's an anomaly or a warning or an alert as defined by urgency in our system. So if you have you know, just minutes left, it's going to be an alert. It's a wake up now and deal with this. If it's a, hey, you know, we, we kind of projected that based on your utilization and, and you know, Monday's coming up and you typically use 3% more on Monday, uh, then we'll tell you, hey, you know, we expect this thing to run out Monday at 423 or whatever. All right, so it just kind of makes it a little bit smarter, essentially, instead of just, you know, you hit a threshold and, and then the alert sends an or email. More proactive than reactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah not just smarter, but, but also automated, right? right? You didn't have to do this thing. You didn't have to tell it the rates. You didn't have to tell it which amount uh, points. Yeah. You didn't have to tell it which servers. Yeah. You didn't have to tell it even a lot disk space. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, not just disk space, but also think about ELBs. Uh, some of our customers have, have had unhealthy systems. They have an ELB, they're doing a health check, and an EC2 falls out of rotation, and they don't have an alert on that until it's zero. Yep. Well, we can tell you when it's half full. Yeah. yeah. So who are your customers? Are you, are you targeting startups? Are you targeting enterprises? Like, where do you land right now? Like, what's, where's the best kind of sweet spot for you? A small, innovative team. Yeah. If you're in maintenance mode, we're not for you. you. You don't really need proactive monitoring if you're in maintenance mode. But if you're a small, innovative team, you're rapidly innovating. I didn't mean to use that word twice. You're rapidly uh, <laughs> iterating on your ideas. You're making new things. You're coming out with new features. It's incumbent on you to delight your customers or to deliver a certain business objective. And, and it's typically in that scenario where there's not enough focus on stability because your directive is make this thing make the product and make the RFID scanner, make the whatever it is. And it's not obvious, it's not in the game plan to stall and, and do monitoring. Right? That it's more of an afterthought uh, to these right. small yep. innovative teams. So whether you're an SM, SMB, mid-market, or enterprise, we, we found these small innovative, innovative teams all across the board, and it's those that are you know, rapidly innovating that, uh, that, that find value in saving the time on specifying thresholds and telling us what metrics matter and, and rolling out new monitoring tools and everything that's involved with that. So. Yeah, and maybe that's the difference between having, you know, instead of having one cloud infrastructure guy or two cloud infrastructure guys, you can just have one, have the other guy focus on something. Or girls. Person. Yeah, yes. for sure. The yeah. other person. Yeah, we, we've seen people that have been unable to hire more DevOps uh, engineers or more cloud engineers, more SREs, whatever they are, uh, that augmented what they have with Blue Matador because they, they just couldn't find more people. I think we're finding that more and more. Yeah. So I was talking to somebody today a little bit about the, the kind of landscape of technology here in Utah. We were trying to identify like real enterprises. And if, if I'm graduating from the universities here in Utah, do I land at, at a large organization that can kind of help drive me, you know, into, into best practices and really understand, uh, you know, best business practices? And so... Um, it feels like that there isn't a lot of that, that generally there's actually more of these like small, cohesive teams that are innovative, that are rapidly improving, iterating, uh, you know, being scrappy. It feels like, like Utah has a really, is a really good target for you. Um, do you see that uh, maybe even on the sales side, but also that, uh, you know, in hiring, being yourselves kind of a smaller, scrappier team as well, that you're able to do that well here in Utah? Like, Utah feels like a good home for, for Blue Matador? Oh, hiring is impossible. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. impossible here in Utah. So we, we've got a couple of open positions we've been actively interviewing, and it's just impossible. You, you can't find good talent uh, for, for, for a reasonable price at all. In fact, uh, I can't remember who I was speaking to, but uh, somebody said, no, no, it was an article. We saw an article that said uh, the Utah market for engineers is as competitive as San Francisco is. Wow. I mean, take take that for what it's worth. I can't quote it even a source, but yeah. uh, certainly anecdotally, that's what we're finding. It's impossible to find. We find good people, and they say, "Oh, you know, I kid you not, this has happened." Found a good person. He said, "I won't move unless it, you know, for less than two hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars," which is insane. That's a right? <laughs> that's a, a, I, I've never been paid that much, and yeah. and you know. Uh, I'm not the best, but I'm good. Yeah. Uh, you certainly could fill that position, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's insane. It's very difficult to well, hire. We've heard, right we've heard some other people come in and talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, 
you know, folks in San Francisco or the Bay Area are actually hiring people here in Utah and, and saying, yeah, just stay, re remain remote in Utah. So you get to the kind of cheaper, you know, living style here in Utah, but the salary of Silicon Valley, right? Like that's, that's hard to compete with. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Especially when you're here getting the investment sizes that you receive in Utah as opposed to the investment sizes in San Francisco, and, and you've right. got to compete with their investment sizes, their cash capital. Uh, it's very difficult. But I, I think, you know, for, for all, all the complaining that I do, all, all the negative stuff, we actually have a, a good, uh, a very good attractor, a very good competitive edge on hiring. We offer stock, right? You can go to a lot of startups here in Utah. Lucid's one of them, uh, and perhaps I shouldn't name any others. Uh, and... They, you know, they, they purport that they're a startup. They're not a startup. <laughs> you can play games with stock where you can say, hey, you know, I'll give you 4 million shares, and it turns out that's nothing. It, it doesn't matter. And I'm not saying Lucid does that in particular, but I've seen it done. And we actually give out, you know, we tell you the denominator. Uh, we, we care enough that you want stock that we will tell you that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I think that, uh, that does us well, uh, but it's very, compete, uh, very hard to compete on the cash. Yeah, so um, just some quick fire questions here for you about Blue Matador and uh, just the key technologies you use. Um, what uh, what do you guys use for ticketing? Jira. Jira, all right. Um, CRM as well? Or? CRM, HubSpot. HubSpot, okay. Um, how about source control? Uh, Bitbucket. Bitbucket. That's what it's called, right? The Jira thing? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah that exactly. Oh, it's uh, been a while I since forget. I... I'll, I'll admit, it's been a while since I committed or looked at it or anything. You're a true so, CEO now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, How about the text, tech stack itself, the programming languages you use? So we have an agent that's written in Golang, right. and that runs on Linux and Windows. And we picked it. So I originally wrote that in Python, and it was just terrible. Mm -hmm. So swapped it maybe six months later to Golang, and drastic improvements. So Golang on the agent, and on the back end, the server side, it's uh, Scala with the Play 2 framework. Uh, database, we, we, use, uh, we, we use a lot of RDS and Dynamo, the, uh, the AWS databases. And then in the front end, we use, what is it, uh, FlowType and React. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you an Agile show? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate you being here with us, Matthew, today. This has been fantastic. Co-founder and CEO of Blue Matador. Uh, thank you all for listening to the Utah CTO show. Uh, Matthew, you mentioned that you've got a couple openings even in the in your dev team. Um, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, uh, wants to even use the product, like what's the best way to connect with you guys? Yeah, using the product, uh, I, I guess, anyway, uh, whether that's for uh, HR, you know, to come, come join us, join the team, or for sales or questions or whatever, yeah, me, Matthew at bluematador.com. Uh, not particularly difficult to remember, but two T's. Yeah. So two T's, yeah. We're, we're actively hiring devs. Uh, we're, uh, our dev team is currently two people. Like, you will literally be in the ground mm -hmm. floor. Uh, our sales team, we're just hiring two people right now. We just made an offer today. And... Let's see, marketing is one, like, we're a very small company, yeah. right? six people. Uh, so, yeah, just email me directly, matthew at bluematador.com. Happy to help you out. Awesome. Again, thanks for being with us. Really appreciate that. And don't forget to subscribe to the Utah CTO Show. Yeah, you can we're, on, uh, we're on every uh, major podcasting uh, uh, outlet. Yeah, iTunes, Spotify, everything that, uh, that you use. So don't forget to subscribe and like us on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Thanks.